A big welcome to today's virtual education roundtable. How do we help disadvantaged students catch up and ensure social mobility following their return to school from COVID-19? For those of you tweeting during the event today, please use at Sam Learning and hashtag Sam Social Mobility. We will be running for an hour in total, ending at 3 p.m. We've had a fantastic response to this event with almost 200 people registered, including 16 MPs and five members of the House of Lords. This subject clearly strikes a chord with a lot of people, particularly when we read in the press reports from the likes of Education Endowment Foundation saying that 10 years progress in closing the attainment gap by disadvantaged students is likely to have been lost in the last 10 weeks as a result of the crisis. For the first 25 minutes or so, we will hear from our panelists for about five minutes each. Then I will be putting questions to the panel that have been submitted by you and other attendees. Please submit your questions through the chat function, which is at the bottom of your screen. Please include your name and the organization you represent. And if your question is addressed to one of the panelists in particular, please say who. And what a fantastic panel we have for you today. We have Naomi Eisenstadt, CB, who was the inaugural director of DFE's Sure Start Unit and is a former advisor to the First Minister of Scotland, a trustee at the Education Endowment Foundation and a fellow of both the University of Oxford and the LSE. We have John Murphy, CEO of Oasis Community Learning, a highly regarded multi-academy trust, and we have David Johnston, OBE MP, the Conservative MP for Wantage and member of the Education Select Committee, who's also former CEO of the Social Mobility Foundation. Last and probably least, given the illustrious CVs of the other panellists, is me, David Jaffa. I run the Jaffa Foundation, where with the support of Morgan Stanley, we started the National Talent Academy a youth education program modelled on the football academies in which we select students from disadvantaged backgrounds, coach them in work-related skills and help them find work opportunities with prestigious companies that they wouldn't otherwise get. And my day job is the founder of Sam Learning, an online learning program covering GCSE and Key Stage 3 subjects that started 20 years ago with the mission to provide a launch path for career and life for young people. SAM Learning is used in hundreds of English secondary schools for online review and assessment. And during the COVID crisis, we saw usage up to seven times the uh, normal level from before lockdown, which included a massive influx of teachers who are teaching online for the first time. Sam Learning's interest in sponsoring this event is that we had a report published last month, which was commissioned by the Education Endowment Foundation, involving 300,000 pupils from 250 schools who used Sam Learning over nine years. And we will be distributing a one pager about that report to attendees after today's event. The report showed a significant positive effect for all students who used Sam Learning for 10 hours or more, but a stronger significant positive effect for disadvantaged pupils, which was the equivalent of between a fifth and more than half a grade per subject improvement. But the report also found that disadvantaged students, who are the group that benefit most, actually use the program less than other students. Posing the challenge for the education system, how do we ensure that those students who need it most at this time of crisis get the additional support they need. So without further ado, I'm going to pass that question on to our first panelist, Naomi Eisenstadt, CB, the inaugural director of DfE Sure Start Unit, former advisor to the Minister of Scotland, trustee at EEF and fellow of the Universities of Oxford and the LSE. Naomi. 
Thanks, for, thanks very much, David, and thanks for inviting me. I always like to start, even though I've only got a few minutes, to say that my first job in the UK was in a social services day nursery in Edinburgh as a nursery assistant. So I have worked at every level. I wasn't always in the dizzying heights um, and learned a lot from working at the grassroots level, particularly with, with poor kids. Um, my job is to tell you the bad news and then the others can tell you how we can mitigate the bad news. But you will all know that children from poor backgrounds start school behind and finish school even further behind. The gap widens through the secondary years. So um, on entry to school, children are about 18 months behind. By the time they are at GCSEs, they are, um, um, uh, eight, they are a year and a half behind. And 40% of the gap starts in the early years. 40% of the gap in um, children's outcomes from poorer backgrounds starts before they even enter school. Um, I want to say something about, you know, why COVID will widen the gap rather than narrow it. And I think it's pretty, pretty basic. I mean, the early years system has been underfunded consistently and is staffed by poorly qualified, low pay workforce that, um, uh, you know, I mean, basically, in, um, you will know David from young people's career opportunities for girls who don't do particularly well at school, the choice is hair or care. So we put our children in the hands of the, of the young people who are doing less well at school and therefore their ability to encourage children in their learning is, is weaker. I think that the pandemic is going to make all this worse because we know in the early years the most important impact on children's learning is the home learning environment. The home learning environment can be good across class. It doesn't mean that all poor parents do not provide a good learning environment. It means it's harder to do if you're poor. And clearly in times of stress and the stress of delivering more for children with less resources, it becomes, mu it becomes much harder. Also, interestingly enough, poor kids have much less access to outdoor play, which has been really important during the, academic, uh, during the epidemic for, for poor kids. Um, for school-aged children and young people, well, you'll know these stories, numbers of laptops in the home, the quality of the Wi-Fi, but also the thing that we miss out is the quality of the housing itself. So if there's more than two children in the home, is there a space quiet enough to do homework? Is there a space to do the kind of work you need to do? And is there the sport at home to do it? Um, so the numbers, we do know that um, children, families with more children tend to be poorer. So that exacerbates the effect of poor housing on, on, children's, on children's educational outcomes. Post-16s, I mean, one of the things, while we were really delighted in how much money the government was offering in terms of makeup on COVID, it did not include early years and it didn't include post-16s. And we know that before COVID and through the austerity years, um, that um, FE colleges were hit much, much harder in terms of cuts than universities. So where the most well-off kids went got the most money, where the poorest kids went got the least money. This is particularly uh, in a report that I did for the Scottish government, life chances of 16 to 24 year olds. So I suppose the, my main point, which is a very tough point for today, is that we can mitigate the impact of poverty, but there are other contributors like housing, transport, family relationships, and stress all have an impact on the social class gradient and education uh, outcomes. And I'm afraid to say, David, in terms of your poster, no country in the world has closed the gap. Some countries do better at narrowing it than Britain does. And those countries that do better at narrowing the gap have less inequality overall but every country has a social class gradient in educational outcomes. There are things you can do, but it's not just about education, it's about the wider system. Education will mitigate it, but it will not solve all the problems. Thank you very much, Naomi. So I, I, I took away from that um, the importance of a supportive home environment, physical environment, as well as uh, parents, of course, uh, things like uh, laptops and, and uh, good quality Wi-Fi, um, but it's a, it's a broader and a very tough problem overall. Okay, so we're going to move on now to John Murphy, CEO of Oasis Community Learning, a highly regarded multi-academy trust uh, that uses SAM Learning. John.
So, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, that was a little slightly suspenseful start. So, uh, my name's John. Uh, I am the CEO of Oasis Community Learning, and I've been in that post, privileged to serve the organisation for the last five years. Across the country, we've got 52 academies, uh, 32 of those are primary and 20 secondary. So, we serve at the moment 31,000 children, uh, and uh, I'm accountable and responsible for. Uh, just over 5,000 staff across the country. I think the most important fact is that the families that we serve, 47% of those are free school meal families. And so there's high degrees of poverty. And in many of the communities that we have had up during this period of COVID have been really challenging indeed. Um, also, in terms of a background to the organisation, 80% of the academies that we've taken on have been sponsored. In other words, have been in failing in local authority care and we've now moved from 30% to 80% good or better in terms of Ofsted. So the schools are in a positive trajectory, but need every bit of support. And our families need, as Naomi said, every bit of support. So within Oasis, what we try to do is transform the communities through a whole range of interventions. It might be food banks, it might be credit unions, uh, et cetera, to make sure that we think about not just education, but more than education that deliver into our communities. What we have found during the period of COVID is a number of interrelated issues that have been a, an enormous strain on the families. There's been food poverty. We've had heightened safety uh, regards. So there's been a 43% increase over the 123 days now. There's been a 40%, 43% increase in safeguarding issues. We now have off the 31,000 children there are now 5,419 students on our concern list, our vulnerable list, which is a huge increase over this period of time. We've seen increase in trauma and abuse. Um, we're very concerned about the lost learning time. If we think about really a period of five months, March to now, and obviously the government's made the decision about exams next summer in anticipation. In terms of connectivity through all the auditing and the work that we've done, we've had about 30% of our students with no access. So we've pulled all the devices of the trust and then we've given those to key year groups across the piece. We're very much aware, as Naomi said, about the disadvantage gap widening, but particularly in our communities with that loss of access about how that gap further widens and how do we restore that. And in many respects, the recession that is coming on board will give even greater challenges to the students in what they're trying to achieve. I think it's really important to talk about the support for families as much as anything else so um, in terms of a couple of facts um, we've had to make 77,000 uh, kit calls keeping in touch calls with parents during this time to make sure that they're okay and we've been doing food deliveries to those families to make sure the prerequisites for learning of safety and food are in place for all of our families so from our staff we've just had the most remarkable response from our staff and how they supported them for our children when we're thinking about a child not just learning but a child flourishing there's been a, a loss of social interaction there's been a loss of structure and routine and feedback there's been a loss of freedom for many of our families in cramped living conditions a loss of friendships wider relationships opportunity academic learning and we have had a number of deaths within families so our students are anxious to restart and restart well they're resilient but they're anxious to recover the lost time and they want to help us to help them get restart that learning. During this COVID period, just very briefly, we've had online teams learning. We've had programs like Share My Homework, Work Pack for Students Who Aren't Online, delivering that to families. We've had complete IT access for year 5, 10 and 12 in anticipation of uh, uh, exams in the, or tests in the following years. And in our primary schools, we've we used Class Dojo, work on you know, BBC Bite Size, home learning packs, et cetera, all the sorts of things that many of the organisations have done. But I think primarily, when we're thinking about September, we want to be able to, um, in many respects, embed the learning during this period. So we're putting in uh, an opportunity to really enhance the learning from this period, because what it's really made us realizes what's precious for our families. So we want to not just restart September, but we want to reset what's important about education for us. So what we're going to do, we've been putting in training over the last 12 weeks, a high level, high quality pedagogy training online for 900 of our teachers every week. 
to make sure that everyone is fully uh, uh, upskilled in that area. We're making sure that there are uh, the ACEs training, adverse childhood experience training has gone in place to support students in terms of their mental health on return. And that framework's gone in for all 5,000 staff. We've made sure that we've created a recovery curriculum. So we're closing the gap from where the children were when they, some of them left us in March. And of course, we're differentiating that approach from those children who've had no engagement, engagement and full engagement. We are also working with Teach First. We've employed out of the recovery monies that have been given by the government. I've um, recruited 55 Teach First teachers. So every one of our schools get a Teach First colleague. And those Teach First colleagues will go in and then offset a more experienced teacher to work in small groups with those groups, small groups of disadvantaged students. So what we're trying to do is to make sure that our children know that as soon as they restart with us, the most precious thing we're going to have is time. And the big item, really, the big ticket item as well, is that we're going to make sure that every child has a device from September and will have access to uh, online learning or face-to-face -face learning depends on how the rates of infection then come back and affect those families because obviously we are all preparing for a second wave if that happens but there'll be localized lockdowns and how will we have the agility as a multi-academy trust to make sure every child every family stays connected thank you david that, that's that's really really helpful john thank you it's um it's poignant how basic some of the issues are like 30 percent of kids not having access food poverty yeah. the dramatic increase in safeguarding issues and and trauma that kids are experiencing um and it's great to hear about some of the solutions as well that you've been making extensive use of online platforms in general that uh, you've, you've been involving 900 teachers in teacher training for online which my own hobby horse of 20 years of the sector is it's always the evil stepchild of, of uh, government initiatives so the bit that always gets forgotten is the teacher training so that's great that you're doing that and putting in place a recovery curriculum and also that you're able to make use of government initiatives such as the 55 teach first to bring on board so thank you very much for that and we may be hearing more about the uh, government approach now from David Johnston over you, MP for Wantage and member of the Education Select Committee. David. Hi. Um, well, look, I'm going to touch on some of the things that, that, that have already been touched on. But I mean, Naomi set out the gap in terms of, of months. And I think that's right. And she's also right to say it widens at secondary school. I mean, it's it's we have a gender gap in education, we have an ethnicity gap in education, but no gap is, is bigger than between poor children and non-poor children. And it's 21 percentage points at the end of key stage two, it's 28 percentage points at the end of secondary school. And I am absolutely certain it's got worse during the lockdown period and everything we've heard on the education committee suggests the same. Uh, there's been one stat about online lessons that 79% of children at private school have been getting getting online lessons compared to 41% of our poorest children in state schools. So I am um, pretty confident that that, that that gap has widened. I think the things that the committee uh, and then particularly myself are thinking about, laptops and internet access are definitely an issue. Um, but I personally don't think that online learning of any kind is a substitute particularly for our poorest children being in the classroom and having face-to-face -face learning. And I feel that about all sorts of things, by the way. I feel the same about virtual work experience. I think it's great to have online um, programs to give you work experience, but again, not a substitute for being in the employer itself. So um, that definitely is an issue. Uh, but given what we know about summer learning loss, the fact that some children will have been out of school for at least six months come September, uh, should worry us all. Um, the second thing as has been touched on is about mental health. So I think there's two big groups. There's a group of young people and children who already had mental health issues and in being confined to their home for most of this period, those have got worse. There are then children and young people who did not have mental health issues who have 
develop them during this period. And I hear from a lot of uh, parents in my constituency about how their confident, friendly, outgoing child has become a shy, introverted, nervous child during this period. Um, and that's probably at the low end of, of, uh, of problems that have been encountered in this period. I think, unfortunately, as we all know, home is the worst place for some children to be. Um, and so I think when schools do return, as much as everything they've got to do on, on the uh, sort of academic learning to catch up, there will be um, some very uh, strong support needed on their emotional well-being um, and mental health uh, support as well. The third thing I'm concerned about, uh, which is a particular thing for me, I mean, I, th I think it is a thing for the committee, but it, it, it is, um, I don't say this on behalf of the committee, um, is about destinations. So I have thought for a long time that really the way we ought to judge schools and colleges on the destinations of where pupils end up going after they leave them. We've got some destinations data. I don't think we've really used it as much as we should have. And I'm very concerned that destinations are going to be skewed uh, as a result of this in terms of where people would have been going to do an apprenticeship, get a job, do further education, do higher education. I'm, I'm worried about that. The committee brought out a report about the process for um, calculating exam results, which we've got some real concerns about, and I can go into those in, in more detail. Um, but certainly I think that's not going to be a perfect system to capture what uh, grades children would have been on, on course for. Um, and the last thing, which is, which is a, a broader point, um, in a situation where all children have been affected by something, the natural response is, is to um, want quite a generalist approach to that, that all children have missed learning, all children need to catch up learning, all children need certain support with mental health and other things. So I have a worry that we might lose focus on the most disadvantaged children in this period because um, you can see from administration to administration and depending on who you talk to some some people have a laser-like focus on that disadvantage gap they think it really matters some people take the view that actually you want to raise uh, raise the outcomes for all children I think we are um, in a position where understandably we will be concerned about all children from this period but I hope that we don't lose sight of the fact that it will be the disadvantaged children who've probably fallen furthest behind and need even more support to try and get back to the level they should have been at. David, thank you very much. So I, I've picked up your, your four themes there, learning loss, mental health issues, uh, where the issue of where students go next, given the problems over the exam system at the moment, including apprenticeships, and the danger that we may lose focus on disadvantaged children in this, in, in the way we respond. Thank you. Uh, so I've got, a, I've got some questions uh, coming through on the chat question here from uh, Lord Massey, Doreen Massey. This is for the panel. Uh, why and how do we tackle this? Social mobility has been a problem for many years before COVID. Families are now likely to be thrown into greater poverty, especially vulnerable ones. How can catch-up programmes provide a broad and balanced curriculum to help young people out of this situation? That is not just academic approaches, but including art, sport, etc. And how is pastoral care provided? I don't know. Naomi, do you want to start with that? Um, sure, thank you. Uh, you're right, Doreen, it's been a very, very long time and nobody's cracked it. And there's an analysis of Carrie Up and I, and I just wrote a book called Parents, Poverty and the State on the wider issues of family policy in the last 20 years. And I think the difficulty is about a dual approach, which is reducing pressures on families while increasing capabilities. 
And there's a lot of work going on on building parental capabilities, which of course is very good, but unless it's acceptable to the family, it won't have any impact at all. And it's interesting what happened with the SAM uh, study that said, well, this really worked, except people didn't want to use it, or the people who needed it the most didn't want to use it. So at the same time, and this of course is where it isn't just education, reducing pressures on families is about poverty reduction. It's, and, and that isn't just about, um, um, about money, it's also about the way in which services are delivered, it's about the proximity to services, it's about open access as well as targeted. I just want to say uh, in response to David, I agree with everything that you said and I think losing sight of targeting is really, really tempting right now, but it's very, very important not to do it. It's very, but the targeting shouldn't just be about disadvantage, it is about poverty itself that disadvantages kids. So it's a dual approach of reducing pressures and increasing capabilities. And unless you do both at the same time, it's not likely to work. Thank you. Um, John, do you want to take that one on? So um, there's a dual response from us, but in a slightly different way. Um, we don't talk about disadvantaged students, we talk about disadvantaged families. And so as an organisation, we have, Oasis has a number of charities as part of it. One of those is Oasis Community Partnerships. And what we try to do is provide credit union support for families. We run food banks and fair, through Fair Share. We have mentoring programmes for disadvantaged families. And at the same time, we have advice to families. You know, it might be families at home suffering mental health who need to be able to visit or access to support. So it's a bit, it's, for example, what we do is we focus on the 20, and very much in terms of David Johnson's point, we fo focus very much on the 20 most disadvantaged families in each one of the schools, which are sometimes untouchable families who aren't being best served. But within the school, within the school context, so we do a lot within the families, but within the school context, nothing replaces high, high quality pedagogy. Uh, nothing you know, really focuses on a very differentiated, specific, small group support and the research that we've done and the research shown you know internationally is that if you're having students in groups of two and three with a very highly skilled teacher and you're focusing as david said very much on a highly differentiated program of basic skills and gap analysis and making sure you're getting your best teachers there i think sometimes our students in in that in the most 20 20 percent dis most sorry 20 most disadvantaged families frankly don't get the best teachers so what we've got to do is use our very best teachers at the earliest stage possible, particularly in terms of early years, to be able to raise the bar. And I think for, for us as an organisation, it's whether you want to be a grumpy GP or a very happy postman, it's about giving our children a choice about what they want to be able to do in their lives. And so that's our contribution. It's about equity for us uh, and making sure that they're able to stand tall with their peers uh, nationally. Thank you, John. Um, David, your thoughts on this? How do we really help vulnerable young people? And uh, do you feel that the government's uh, response is enough at this time? Um, well, I think uh, the, the aspect we haven't talked about, and as you say, I was, I was CEO of the Social Mobility Foundation uh, directly before becoming an MP, is, is the other actors. So undoubtedly, families are important and undoubtedly schools are important but all the other actors are really important too universities employers our colleges these are really important too because you can do um incredible work at the early years stage and at schools but if you find actually those institutions have got barriers up in the way that they select people in the way they assess potential and who, who, what they're looking for and so on then uh, you may not get the social mobility you want anyway. I mean, of course, education is, is fundamental and is your home environment. But one of the things uh, we try to do there, and what still continues to go on, is to get those institutions to take some responsibility for the things they do, for the way they engage with young people, for the way they structure their programmes, for the way they assess talent and potential. Um, because that's that's a pretty key part of social mobility too. Now I understand it's probably not going to be the focus here, but uh, but I think it's important. 
Um, and in terms of, of government, I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not really here to be a defender of the, the, the government. Um, I think it has done some good things as ever. There are things I would like to see it it do more um, and we push the you know and we push through the education uh, committee to be able to see those things the one thing we haven't touched on yet is about regional variations because in every measure you look at those are vast and maybe we'll get into some of that in some of the questions um, but you know it's easy to take quite a southern view of it where there are a lot of people who discuss these things are based around London and the southeast actually uh, try doing some contrast between education outcomes and so on and those places and and actually most places in the UK but but particular spots um, and it's an even wider gap even for the same children you know you could be as poor in those two areas but have better outcomes in London than you do elsewhere. Thank you, David. Um, quite another question here from Joycey John. Uh, this is for John Murphy. Uh, thanks, John, for sharing your insights and facts about how Oasis has responded to COVID-19. What would be most helpful for you as you plan for the next phase and longer term addressing inequality in education? Gosh. I think... Um, there's a specific group of children who I have I've always worried about. Um, so, in, in in the light of what David David just said, there's a there is a there is a subgroup of children who get missed in education. One of the things that uh, Oasis is fundamentally committed to is a strong ethos of inclusion. And funnily enough, last night I had dinner uh, with one of my previous students from 17 years ago. I used to run an EBD school, a school for boys with emotional behaviour difficulties, and he, um, he's done a remarkable job. Uh, he runs a company now called The Good Guys. He's a painting and decorating company. Uh, but he's had uh, a, number of, uh, a number of stretches in, in prison. And he's been on a number of BBC programmes recently just talking about how there's a certain group of students, for example, because of the way that our system works to sometimes doesn't include children with some of the, 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 the largest needs. And I think it's especially for me, it's about these children a, with special educational needs or who children come from extreme poverty and how there needs to be very dedicated funding towards those families, not just the children. So I think it has to be almost like a 100 percent funding program for those families in greatest need. That would give us those designated funds to deal with those families in the, in the highest level of need. And I think they're sometimes the, the children who escape our hands in many respects or go through our fingers and in, in, working, uh, working with them. So it's about um, early intervention. I, I completely agree with what Naomi said. It's about getting them when they're young and making the difference, particularly between three and five in terms of their, you know, their accelerated learning uh, levels that they go through. And it's making sure that they have, in terms of Maslow's hierarchy, all the basis of those need there. And that comes down in the same way to housing. That's why we also run a housing organisation as well called Oasis Community Housing. And we house over 1,500 um, homeless people each year. So it's about trying to create all the interventions in a holistic way. And as sometimes within government departments, it's very siloed in approach, where actually it needs to be integrated uh, in, in the approach to families because they meet so many different um, individuals and professionals. And we know that families need to be nurtured consistently. Thank you, John. Um, question here from Colleen Jennings Rogensack from Arizona State University, who got up very early this morning to join us. <laughs> um, can the role of cultural education, the arts, make a difference in the online experience? Can it provide new access points? I don't know if anyone has a perspective on that. I can do that if you want. Go for it. Um, we've, we've, um, within Oasis, we've released a vision and the vision, um, there are a number of points around that in terms of cultural capital. So what we've, what we've tried to do, what we're doing across the open, I'm not trying to do, I won't be apologetic. What we ambitiously want to achieve in every one of our schools is an opportunity for all of our children to attend a residential trip outside their own area. So they get to visit in a sense of aspiration. 
We want each one of our children to be able to visit a theatre, an art gallery, a museum, to be able to build their cultural capital. We want them, all of them, as, as David has said earlier, to be able to visit a university, but also visit a place of work to get an aspiration of what work looks like. Because if we've got 47% of our students who have come from families who aren't in work, then actually what does it look like physically to see? We're releasing programmes to make sure that every child has an opportunity to play a musical instrument, uh, have an opportunity in student leadership, and not just, not just student leadership, but also mentoring and supporting another child, particularly around the themes of equality and diversity. We also want to make sure that they focus a, a hub leadership programme so they do positive citizenship activity within their community. And so they're part of rebuilding and regenerating their own communities. I hate that view. I know it's a middle class view. I hate that view that you'll do well enough to leave the, leave the community that you're in. We want to also uh, uh, build on, of course, in terms of access that every single child who goes into one of our secondary schools is able to read because, uh, you know, if, if you can't do that, and I went to special school as a child because I couldn't read up until the age of uh, 11, um, and that denies access to across the rest of the curriculum. So we are 100%, I think, the cultural capital plays a role in, in, in ensuring that students have the... the I suppose the subject knowledge and, and access and an awareness of what aspiration really looks like practically. You're on mute. Sorry about that. I, I've just had a, a I've just had a uh, message here through from Lord Massey asking to respond briefly to the comments made by panelists on the. Um, on the problem of uh, helping disadvantaged young people. Can we unmute Doreen Massey? Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to thank people for their responses to, to the, the questions. I think it's been very uh, diverse and very profound. I think that, you know, for me, they, they've brought out the complexity of this. It's really, really complicated. And uh, you've mentioned, David mentioned geographical differences, which I think is a, a huge thing that we just haven't been able to, to crack at all. But it's also about aspiration, uh, as was mentioned also, and about the ethnic, ethnicity, gender and class issues. Um, and also, I think, in valuing the input of people themselves at a local level, at a school level, um, you know, Child participation, I, I think, is a great thing. Community participation, I think, is a great thing. It's got to be the way forward. And I don't see a holistic programme coming out from anywhere except at local levels, specific levels, on this. Does anybody? Trying, yeah. to do some, uh, trying to do some bits in the uh, National Talent Academy. But, uh, but you're, you're right, I think it's a huge gap. Any, anyone else have a comment on that? No? Okay. Sure. No. Is it John? Do you want to? Well, I was just going to, I was going to, sorry, I've, I've spoken a lot. I just wanted to, David on there, and we wanted to jump in first. Actually, I wanted to pick up on something that David said, and I think relates to a question coming up. I mean, I really agree that, um, that technology is a great contributor but face-to-face -face is really important. And in terms of the arts and culture stuff, it's a very interesting, I mean, the, the trick is to find out what somebody really loves. So one of the programs in Scotland was about using sports to get to kids. Who, you know, sports wouldn't have helped me. I hated sports, you know. So if, if the way to get me to perform at school was to jump through, you know, was to run, it would have been absolutely impossible. So that trick about how to find out what drives the child what and making sure they're good at something. And once you find out you're good at something, you're more willing to, you know, to accept that maybe some things are much harder, but finding, and I, I'm sure that, that that's what you're doing in Oasis. I mean, it sounds really, really impressive, but I think both of those are really important. Just one more thing about evidence on um, screen time, which when I was a trustee of National Literacy Trust, when people were worried about small children and screen time, so we did a, a, um, a research project on impact on children, and we actually found that it was very good for kids. 
It was good for, in terms of concentration, it was good for their, um, 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 uh, the way in which they used their fingers and all that stuff. But it was always better when they sat and did it with a mother or father. So the difficult, you know, so the bonuses of it were even greater when they had the parental involvement. And it's that mix. It's always about, we really want a magic bullet. There isn't one. Doreen's right. It's really complicated. Yeah, I agree with what Naomi said. I, I ran a charity where we supported other charities that helped disadvantaged young people with grants and so on. And it almost didn't matter what the activity was. It could be boxing, it could be fishing, it could be maths, it could be farm. It, it, you know, it, they were all having really good outcomes with the particular group of uh, children or young people that they work with because they'd found something they were really passionate about and in giving them that focus there were a whole load of other knock-on effects about their schooling work and their behavior and and so on so no, I agree I agree and that includes the arts. Thank you okay a question from Jason Wood some multi-academies have benefits of scale as already explained many smaller trusts or single schools don't with many schools already struggling with budgets and even more unfunded costs, as announced this morning. How can we work together to ensure that money is available to support these students? We as a school were provided with 10 laptops from the government scheme, arrived two days before the end of term. This is not enough for us as a school. More support will be needed, e.g. further tutoring. All of this will cost money. And although we are happy to direct finances to support these students, there is a massive shortfall. How are others planning to do this? Anyone want to talk about funding? I can, I can kick off if that's okay. Um, of the monies that were released, obviously we're very grateful in the system when more money's coming in, but there also needs to be clarity as to what's being taken away. So as much as the one billion came onto the table, which is, you know, it, which is fantastic, um, together with the uh, computers. For our 31,000 students, by comparison, we got 571 computers ac across the 31,000, but we were gratefully received those and have utilised those uh, at the earliest opportunity. And like the colleague who's commented in the question, uh, we got those towards the end of term as well, but we'll at least be able to you know, distribute them accordingly to the, to the most needy families. And also it's a great way of staying in contact with them. Um, with the one billion, the year seven transition money seems to have come out of the budget, so it is, it's been really clear as to what the monies are being used for. Um, but it is about economies of scale and it's about um, being able to standardize processes. I think one of the ways in which larger trusts uh, are advantaged is because you're not trying to do things 52 times, you're trying to do one thing well. And thereby, and therefore, by sharing uh, effective practice and expertise across the trust. So, if you've got a good idea, then it's a great. It could be a good idea that's shared everywhere, and that way, it's a way of, um, um, I suppose, doing the heavy lifting on behalf of the trust if that's useful. David, well, on on funding, I mean, look, as I say, I'm not, I'm not here to defend the. The government but there are significant increases going into per pupil funding which i think is right because there's been this historical problem where particular areas and in particularly london has been getting uh, more money per pupil than most other areas of the country and that that definitely makes a a, a difference um so you know we're going to get to at least 5150 per secondary pupil at least 4000 on a primary school pupil um the thing i would say about academy chains and i i say this as a as someone who was a director of an academy chain and involved in setting up academies they're good if they're good you know that the, 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 there isn't something that's inherently good about being in an academy chain. It doesn't automatically raise standards. It doesn't automatically mean that 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 money is well used. I mean, if there's good leadership of the academy chain, then of course you get those benefits of economies of scale and sharing um, the best teaching methods and and so on. But um, it doesn't by itself. Uh, make all the schools in that chain 
good. And we've seen that over the years, that actually some schools have been put into academy chains. And if the overall chain isn't performing well, then those children uh, are no better off. Um, so in theory, they should work well. And I, I think there are a number that do. Uh, but it doesn't always bring the benefits it's intended, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. Um, question to the whole panel from Philip Avery. What lockdown has shown is that a significantly a significant minority of students and their families are not engaged with education in general, not just because of COVID-19. What needs to change to increase the intrinsic motivation of students to want to learn? I mean, that is the, uh, <laughs> that's the $64 million <laughs> question, isn't it? I mean, I, I, look, there are lots of people who do good work on this. And one, um, one organisation that immediately springs to mind is, is School Home Support. That, um, and there are other organisations like it, but, but this is one that, that I, I knew for quite a number of years when I was at SMF. Um, because they work on what exactly is it that, that is meaning that children are not turning up at school or not engaging at school. And, and, and the reasons can be vast. I mean, we know, the, we know the stereotypical, if your parents didn't have a good time at school, they tell their children that, you know, school's not really worth anything. And, you know, we know all that sort of stuff. But it can be a huge spectrum of things going on at the home that mean uh, going on in the home that mean that the child is is not engaging. It can be embarrassed about the uniform being dirty and sometimes school home support by a washing machine for the family so that the uniform can be washed and then the the, the child starts going back to school. You know, it's a huge range of things. And it's it's not, I mean, look, I'd love all schools to be um to be uh, well equipped and great at doing all that work, but they've already got a lot on their plates already. And I do think the voluntary sector, in a whole range of areas, by the way, but I think the voluntary sector has a particular role it can play here in understanding um, what high needs, complex families, you know, we've had this great troubled families program. It was sort of seen as great. Then it was said it wasn't very good. Now we're back to thinking it was, it was good again. Um, you know, that they can do the things around the school that will mean that children engage and allow teachers to, to get on with what we want teachers to get on with, which is teaching. Thank you. Naomi, you must have something to say about intrinsic motivation. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's asking the question from the wrong end of the telescope. So the way that I describe this is, so I'm a consumer, and if I decide to go to John Lewis instead of Marks and Spencers, Marks and Spencers doesn't write me a nasty letter. <laughs> John Lewis is doing something I want, and Marks and Spencers better figure out what it is. And I think that's the trick. It's very hard. But, you know, we, we don't, in the public sector, we blame people who don't want our services. We say it's their fault. They're feckless or they're not interested or they don't have aspiration. Nonsense. You know, we have to figure out, you know, just because they want it, it doesn't mean it works. But if they don't want it, they're not going to come and you're not going to get anywhere. And, you know, we have to take it as marketing. How do you seg segment the market? When we tried to get people to give up smoking, we had a massive success. And that massive success increased health inequalities because some people just didn't like the message and kept smoking and tended to be the poorest people. It doesn't mean it wasn't a good strategy. It was a brilliant strategy. It saved thousands, tens of thousands of lives. But for a particular group, we didn't segment the market and figure out, well, why do they keep smoking? We just thought they were stupid or feckless or didn't care. So it is turning it round into a more, you know, what what can I do to make it more attractive rather than what can they do to be more motivated? I really like that turnaround, Naomi. Thank you for that. Uh, John? Yeah, I just, um, Ken Robinson's book on passion is about a fundamental belief that every child is good at something. Um, I think we need the highest quality people in the teaching profession. The teachers I work alongside are passionate and I think they're passionate about two things. They're passionate about developing the character of children so they can have the self-belief and skills to have a flourishing life. And I think society and education needs to think about what does it mean to have a flourishing life, to be happy, to be content, to have well-balanced mental health, to, you know, to have you know, enough food on the table, etc. 
but also to have the knowledge and skills to choose their own pathway. But as, as Naomi said earlier, it's about that belief that every child is good at something and it's about our job to make sure that we're attracting them in so they can see the purposefulness of education. And that's when you've got so many different standardised education forms, it doesn't work that way. So we, what we've got to be able to do is to have, to have the courage to innovate and do things differently. And that's down for us as an education sector to really lead on. Thank you, John. Um, question from me, really. What, what, what role do you think EdTech uh, will play as um, schools go back? And, uh, you know, is that, w w was it a one-off while uh, schools were closed down? Is this a permanent part of the mix? What is the role of technology now? I think that if we ignored COVID-19 altogether and almost said, well, what's the role of the tech anyway? I think for, for us, we're delivering something now called the New Horizon or the Horizons Project because it's about creating a world that many of our children have not been able to see beyond yet. So we're picturing it in that way as a project. Um, if we're thinking about how that technology can be differentiated for each child's learning, my own daughter has had a, an iPad that she's been working on for the last few weeks while her school's been closed for the, you know, the well, 123 days, I think it is, since COVID-19 started. And she's been online every day and she's got better, she's got more confident at maths using that iPad than she's ever been with any teacher. So I think that it's about saying in, in many respects, what are the programs? What's the learning that can take place? We want every one of our children to be an inquirer, to be a researcher. If they haven't got that iPad, if they haven't got that tool in front of them, how are they going to do it? Every time I talk to my daughter, for example, about history, she'll look on the iPad, research it very quickly. You know, and I just think it's giving them the tools, it's giving them the platform for learning. And if they've got great teaching as well, fantastic. But it's about access to knowledge and access to, to a whole range of skills. So it's not just about COVID. I think, it's, I think the future is that way. And as we know, many young people will use uh, that IT much more intuitively than we do. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, uh, as um, the report we had published last month demonstrates, these tools do work and they do help disadvantaged kids. It's how can we get uh, those kids to, to have more access and more use of those type of tools. Uh, Naomi or David? No, David? I'm probably not the guy you want to answer this question because I, <laughs> because I am, I am, look, I think it's important um, as, 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 a, as a sort of tool that supplements the other kind of learning that, that you need to, to do. But if you gave me a choice between giving a child a screen or a book, I would pick the book, uh, even above the book on the screen, by the way. And uh, I just think that, um, you know, there, there is a risk. I, I think it can do some things very well. I think the example of looking up things to research is a good one, but I'm not sure people are retaining that knowledge in the same way. You know, you know you can jump on a screen, find the answer and give that answer. I'm not sure it's being retained for future knowledge. Um, so I'm pretty traditional on that, I'm afraid. Uh, so I'm probably not your guy. So David, on your, ten, on, your, on your times tables now, programs are differentiated. So if you don't get, you don't, if you don't get your, you know, your fours right, you're not moving to your fives. So I think the way these programs are actually relating That's to good. the stage of knowledge that children are at is, is prolific. I think the other thing is that if you're a child with autism or a whole range of different special needs, the ways these programs are now geared to support you is that I would have loved as a child. Yeah. No, look, I think you make a really good point. And one of the interesting things maybe for the people who've, who've joined this call, and some of them will already know it, but you know what the education committee has been hearing is that some children with special, special educational needs have absolutely flourished during mm, lockdown. Yeah. You know, I mean, we've heard this regularly that, that actually they're thriving in a way that they haven't been uh, in, in school. So, you know, none of these things are, are, uh, are one size fits all. So um, I definitely think they have a role. I suppose I particularly feel that for the um, softer skills, 
that we especially uh, can focus on disadvantaged children not having in the same way that middle class children have. They need to be in the room with people. And however much we sit behind this screen, you know, we talk to our friends behind the screen, it's not the same as being in the room uh, with them. Um, but but I, I totally accept that they can do some things very well. Okay, I think, I think we've got time for one more question, which is from Wayne Holmes at Nesta. The focus over years by many has been almost exclusively on socioeconomic gap, yet that gap has been getting wider even before COVID. Panelists mentioned the other drivers of achievement gaps, geography, gender, ethnicity, family setup, immigration status, etc. Is it not likely to be a focus on the interaction and multiplication of these various gaps that will help address them all? which unique focus on the silo of SES has failed to achieve? Uh, can I go first on that one? I think that, I mean, the first thing to say is that the, the SES gap is the largest. It's larger than the gender gap and it's larger than the ethnicity gap. Um, now, it's true to say that you might have what I suppose would be called double disadvantages. So being poor and being in an area as a country where the education standards aren't as good, say, as they are in London, um, you might have a double disadvantage. And perhaps in some circumstances, you might have a, you might have a triple disadvantage. Um, but I do think that, that that gap is hugely important. And it's hugely important partly because one of the places that poor children do worse are in these leafy affluent schools you know i mean we focus on the sort of inner city area coastal area and so on actually in places like berkshire where it looks like by the averages that everybody's doing well those are often the places poorest children are doing worse so without that focus on 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 that gap i think um things could be a lot worse now it has narrowed it did narrow between um in the sort of 10 years to 2017, then it started to, to widen again. Although interestingly, we heard from the EPI that, for the, it goes partly to Naomi's point, for those in persistent poverty where their parents have been unemployed for 80% of the, the period, that gap never closed. So there is a group within the disadvantage that, that the gap has never closed even a jot for. Thank you, David. I, I, it looks like you're going to have the final word. Oh, uh, sorry. In, in, no, not at all. Not at all. But, uh, uh, in closing, I want to thank our panellists, Naomi Eisenstadt, CB, John Murphy and David Johnston, OB, as well as all of the attendees, especially those who ask questions. We will be distributing follow-up material in the next 24 hours, including uh, the material I mentioned about uh, the EEF commissioned report on disadvantaged students closing the gap with SAM learning, as well as a full recording of today's virtual round table. I will stay on the call for another five or 10 minutes if anyone wants to stay on and touch base or arrange any follow-ups, I'm happy to do that now. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll just say thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for joining and uh, goodbye for now. <laughs>